So this week uh, for our final uh, IEEE Power and Energy at UC Berkeley talk for the 2021 spring semester, we're excited to welcome Professor Emiliano Dallanese from CU Boulder. Uh, Professor Dallanese received his PhD from the University of Padova in 2011 and spent some time working at NREL and now is a professor at CU Boulder and uh, has done some really interesting work and we're delighted to have him. He's gonna talk about, uh, as I understand it, feedback-based online optimization of power grids with users in the loop. So uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, uh, Keith, for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you again for uh, uh, for a kind invitation. Uh, this is uh, a, an excellent uh, uh, event and I'm really a pleasure to be part of this, uh, of this uh, series. Uh, so let me start first by uh, acknowledging uh, my students uh, who put uh, you know sweat and efforts into the something that we presented today uh, and let me also acknowledge one of my collaborators uh, Andrea uh, as well as the funding agencies that are kindly supporting this uh, uh, line of work so today I will be focusing on uh, systems uh, possibly networked uh, that can be described with uh, a given uh, differential equation where uh, X is the vector of states, U is the vector of inputs, and W is a vector of uh, uh, unknown uh, exogenous inputs. And examples are, of course, you know, power grids, uh, transportation systems, uh, and if you wish, also uh, electrified uh, transportation systems. Of course, we can find other examples, uh, such as you know, epidemics, uh, uh, robotics. Uh, but today, uh, given the, the main theme of this seminar series, we're going to be focusing on uh, power grids. So typically, when we consider these uh, uh, systems uh, and we consider optimizing the operation of these, uh, of these systems, uh, we formulate an optimization problem that, uh, based on uh, uh, given cost and constraints a steady state. In particular, in formulating this particular automation problem, we utilize an algebraic representation of our, of our dynamical system. In the context of the AC OPF, for example, this is nothing but the AC powerful equations, a steady state. And of course, uh, we have as an input a number of cost constraints and our vector of exogenous inputs, uh, W. Now, what does it mean to solve an automation problem? It means that we can utilize a given iterative algorithm that here is represented uh, with the map calligraphic T. And this, uh, it, this algorithm is repeated until convergence. And then once we converge, we can send down our optimized input to our system. Now, it is clear that in this particular modus operandi, uh, we have two different, we have different time scales, right? When it comes to formulating the optimization problem, we look at the dynamical system as infinitely fast. And in fact, we rely on an algebraic representation of our, of our uh, system. But furthermore, uh, we also assume that the cost of the constraints in our inputs vary sufficiently slow in the sense that they can be constant during the uh, time that is required to execute this iterative uh, algorithm. Further than that, we're also assuming that our inputs, the vector W in this case is known and our cost is known. When we have users in the loop, this means that we have an offline learning procedure that is gonna give us uh, uh, an estimate or a, 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 of our cost function. Now we want to consider uh, we want to consider the case where, for example, in our data uh, change rapidly to the point that they may even change during the execution of the video. Uh, so we need this time separation between the ability of it and uh, execution of the of the algorithm. Further than that, we also would like to uh, consider the case where the input uh, may not be completely known and also the cost may not be completely known. For example, we may have an online learning procedure that is uh, learning or estimating the cost function on the fly based on data. In this situation, we are interested in uh, developing an online optimization with the system in the loop. 
in the sense that we modify the algorithm to accommodate measurements from the system and also to accommodate the possible estimates of cost function and constraints. Does end up with a closed loop system or uh, an algorithm with the plant in the loop. And what we're gonna do is to analyze the performance in terms of optimality and convergence of this closed loop system. This is the focus of uh, today's talk. Now, just, uh, uh, just to, to, to tell you the, the complete story, uh, in, my, in our group, we also do a, a further step, and we consider the case where the time scales of the dynamics of the system and cost and constraints in our solver are comparable. And in this particular case, the objective is to build an online optimization that effectively acts acts as a feedback controller to drive the output of our dynamical system towards well-defined uh, equilibria. And in particular, these equilibrium points are coinciding with optimal solution trajectories of a well-posed optimization problem. This is not part of this talk, but I will be very happy to chat offline about this uh, additional line of work. Now let's delve into this uh, uh, feed concept of feedback-based optimization. And again, let us consider our system, our power grid uh, in this particular case. And I will be primarily focusing on distribution systems. And let us consider our algebraic representation of the system. Now, for simplicity of exposition, let me focus on systems of this form here, uh, where G and H are appropriately built uh, matrices. Just for simplicity, I will make remarks as to how to extend these to generic nonlinear maps. Now, we associate with this system a time varying optimization problem where T is the temporal index, and I consider a discretization of my uh, temporal axis where delta is a given interval. Uh, and uh, I consider a time varying cost function and a time varying constraint. In the sense, we can you can think of it of a cost function that evolves over time, a quadratic function in this particular example, and also we have a feasible region that evolves over time, and of course, a set of global optimizers may evolve over time as well. So overall, this uh, um, time varying optimization problem models optimal solution trajectories for my uh, control input uh, ut star. Now, I would like to remind you that if we wanna identify each one of these optimal solutions, at each time step T, we will need to run an optimization algorithm to convergence. So here T is the temporal index and here K is the threshold index. So again, we have a loop at every point in time. Now, we would like to move away from this particular setting because for instance, we may not know the W and we may not have the luxury uh, to perform a sufficient number of steps uh, before our cost or input uh, change. So overall, uh, we would like to design an online algorithm where the term online refers to the fact that our algorithm here represented by the map T sub T may change even at every step of the algorithm to reflect the changes in the cost and constraints so that we can track uh, a given optimal solution trajectory. But in doing so, I would like to not to require knowledge about my uh, vector W. And further than that, uh, I would like to also, also be able to uh, cope with errors uh, in the knowledge of my cost and constraints. Why? Well, first off, uh, because I may have humans in the loop. And uh, I, I may want to learn on the fly preferences of the customers from feedback, as I will show shortly. But if you wish, you may also learn models on the fly. In this particular example, learn the matrix G or pertinent barrier functions if you want to uh, find a properly, properly formulation of this problem here with barrier functions. Now, before moving into the theoretical part, let me give a couple of examples of applications in the power grids. The, example, the first example is a demand response problem. For example, we may have a neighborhood that can, that is uh, with a number of uh, residential houses that is connected to the same, uh, to the same uh, uh, um, secondary, uh, so to the same point of connection to the feeder. 
And uh, we have that every user or DR may have a different cost function. For example, N here may be the number of houses and the cost function JMT may represent uh, the user dissatisfaction or discomfort uh, for, for a specific uh, set of uh, operating points. So the key, the key point is that uh, uh, these functions here, JMT, may not be known. May not be known because each of us have a different perception of comfort or discomfort for a given temperature. And also my uh, preferred temperature today may be different from yesterday because today I'm not feeling well. So today I may wanna have a different, a different setting relative to yesterday. So overall, uh, synthetic models based on uh, based on larger statistics may not be uh, may not be captured the perception comfort or discomfort of the users in appropriate manner in terms of uh, system we may consider a very simple linear model that captures the overall net power consumed or generated at the at the point of the connection of these uh, of these uh, houses, and if we disregard this, the losses, because for example the lines are sufficiently uh, sufficiently short, we may just consider we may just model y, namely the power at the point of the connection and the sum of the controllable powers um, plus all the sum plus the sum of all the powers consumed or generated by the non-controllable assets. And in terms of cost of constraints, if we wish uh, to have a neighborhood providing services to a grid, we may consider a constraint such, such that uh, my, uh, my net power follows a given reference point uh, for the power up to a given accuracy, or we may consider a soft constraint in the cost that still promotes tracking of this reference point. As an additional example, we can consider, in this case, a feeder as opposed to a portion of the feeder or a, or a community, as in the previous example. And in this case, our map, uh, calligraphic M, can be built based on the AC power flow equations. For example, the U, again, may be the power commands, both active and active power of the controllable devices, with U sub I being uh, the uh, capturing hardware constraints. And again, W can be a possibly gigantic vector collecting all the powers from non-controllable assets. And the vector Y, based on the uh, uh, pertinent electrical quantities of interest, can collect either voltage magnitudes or, pow or the power flows at the point of the connection of the feeder with the rest of the grid. And for instance, in terms of problem formulation, this very generic uh, uh, constraint may capture uh, constraints in terms of voltage magnitude. Or uh, if you, if you want to focus uh, at the point of the connection and we envision the feeder to act uh, as a virtual power plant, we may consider constraints in terms of distance between the net power, active power in this case, at the point of interconnection with respect to a given set point uh, that was agreed upon uh, with the ISO. And uh, since you, you are located in California, you are uh, very much aware of these uh, flexible ramping products when we have feeders that can act as virtual power plants. Now, with this in place, uh, let me go back to this very generic formulation that again can capture different tasks uh, as diverse as the demand response, uh, linearized COPF, full blown uh, nonlinear COPF, and so on and so forth. Uh, and let, let's just try to delve into the uh, 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 synthesis of the main algorithm. To start with, uh, let me just remove these constraints here for simplicity of exposition, and then I will tell you how the technical findings can be naturally extended to more generic uh, problem formulations. Now, let me add a couple of standard assumptions. Uh, first off, we assume that our cost function JT and CT are closed, proper, and convex. So today I will be working with convex problems, uh, but I will make remarks as to how to extend these to non-convex formulations. We also assume that the overall cost is smooth over our set calligraphic UT uniform in time. And we also assume that our set calligraphic UT is, uh, is convex and compact. 
Now, in order for us to uh, characterize the time variability of this optimization problem, we uh, define the so-called drift of the optimal solutions. So whenever the cost function is strongly convex uh, uniformly in time, we can define the drift, uh, sigma t, as the norm of the difference between two consecutive optimal solutions. When the function is convex, but not strongly convex, uh, we can do something similar, but we need to consider, for example, the Hausdorff distance between two consecutive sets of, uh, uh, of global optimizers. In this case, this uh, uh, definition here is uh, <clears throat> well posed when the sets are compact and if the if the cost is strongly convex of course the second definition boils down to the first one now with this in place uh, let us take a look at uh, a part, the mathematical structure of the line algorithm that we are after so first off we would like to build an online algorithm uh, so we need to find the particular mathematical structure of this the map uh, graphic we want to build an algorithm based on first order information, gradients. Why? Because it will be convenient uh, to include the measurements, to accommodate measurement for the system whenever you use gradient information. But before, before showing you how to synthesize the algorithm, let me just make a, re a remark. When we go from static optimization, and the term static refers to the fact that the cost and constraint are static, they do not change over time. And even if we consider the basic case where the cost function is strongly convex and smooth, the picture on the, the figure on the left shows the convergence in terms of suboptimality of objective function with respect to the iteration index of the algorithm for a number of well-known uh, first order methods in the literature. And these trajectories are extremely well-known investigated in the, in the literature. But now, when we go from static to online, we obtain something completely different. You see that the heavy ball method, which exhibits this well-known behavior, actually diverges, may diverge in an online setting. The online gradient method, which is the worst performing method in terms of convergent rate, may actually be the best performing in an online setting. So this tells you that the hierarchies of convergent rates in the online setting is, may be completely different uh, relative to a, to a batch setting, static setting. And this calls for, for a, a rigorous analysis of online methods, uh, even when we know exactly the cost, the constraints, and we know the algebraic representation of the map. Emilio, right. can I yes. ask a question about this? Yes, please. So is, is this... Uh... I mean, I imagine that the second order methods uh, being performing less well than just the gradient descent has to do with the fact that the cost function is changing in time and the second order or quasi second order methods take into account previous measurements to kind of build up momentum or acceleration and the problem has changed, right? Yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. And in fact, the, the behavior of uh, uh, methods with momentum is not well understood when the cost function changes at every point in time. Uh, and in fact, we were trying to prove convergence of, uh, of Nestor method and we haven't been able to, to do it yet. Okay. Uh, we prove convergence of a Nestor method with restarts. So when you restart the momentum. Okay. And this is a very good observation. Momentum when the cost function changes, or, or when do you restart it? Uh, we just restarted at the uh, regular intervals. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That's an interesting result. I'll look into that. Great. Thank you so much for the question. Um, yeah. Now, uh, with this with this in place, uh, let me let me write down explicitly uh, the mathematical form of an online projective gradient method which uh, will be is used to, for us to, to solve in an online fashion our automation problem. So the step is, part, is this one that is where uh, this term here denotes projection to the convex set graphic UT and alpha is a properly chosen step size. Now, uh, in this particular expression, you see that uh, in the computation of the gradient of the function C, I need to I have this particular expression, which is the algebraic representation of my power grid, right? So this implies that in order for me to uh, evaluate the gradient, I need to know precisely the whole vector W. Is this uh, something feasible? May not be. 
if I think of Berkeley uh, behaving as a virtual power plant and I want to run this particular uh, online PGD uh, to, to, comp to update the set points of the controllable devices in Berkeley in real time, I may not be able to run this, uh, to run this particular step. Because for example, my vector WT has dimension that is more than 45,000. Why? Because in Berkeley, I, uh, based on what I could see, you have approximately 45,000 households and therefore W will collect uh, the, the non-controllable powers uh, of each individual household. So this is at least 45,000. So if I imagine to run this particular step every one second, I need to collect 45,000 measurements every one second. So the idea uh, to bypass this particular model-based uh, algorithm is to include the measurements of the network. So you see that here, I can close the loop and I can replace my algebraic representation of the network with a measurement of the system. So in the case of the demand response problem, I, I just need to collect one measurement of the net power exchange the point of the connection instead of collecting measurements of the non-controllable assets of each individual household. And for the example of the feeder, uh, I can collect only a few measurements of voltages in the, in the points of interest. And if you wish, the, the power exchange at the substation as opposed to collecting information on the non-controllable powers uh, throughout the feeder. Now, we would like to do a step further and also consider the case where we run the algorithm also with an approximate cost function JT. And uh, why? Because we would like to consider zero further methods, but also methods as diverse as uh, uh, online learning via Gaussian processes or strongly convex regression uh, methods. And again, uh, the main motivation is because uh, if we have if the function j is associated with a user, uh, we may not know how this user perceives uh, uh, discomfort or dissatisfaction. And therefore we would like to estimate the function j from, uh, from uh, feedback that the user is giving to us. And for example, in this particular talk, I will focus on the case where the feedback is in terms of possibly noisy function evaluations. So for example, if U is the temperature setting right now, I can give a feedback in terms of a rating from zero to 10 regarding my comfort. And this rating Z will be utilized to reconstruct the comfort, comfort or discomfort function of the user. And once we, and again, this feedback can be collected in a very parsimonious manner. Uh, and can be given at infrequent intervals, every hour, three hours, or, or even five minutes. It depends on the willingness of the user to, to interact with the algorithm. So let me dive a little bit more into this uh, before, before proceeding. And for example, we can utilize uh, Gaussian process-based optimization uh, to, to include the, the user feedback. More specifically, if you assume that the, the user can give us a, a number of function evaluations, ZT, possibly noisy, and we uh, impose as a prior on our function J, uh, a Gaussian process model, we can obtain the posterior distribution of our function J condition on the feedback given by the users and on a particular set points on my device. And this posterior, in particular, we can find that the posterior distribution is again a Gaussian process with a given mean and variance that are computable in closed form. Where in this expression here for the mean and the variance depend on the particular kernel that is selected uh, as a prior in my GP regression, the variance of the noise in the function evaluation. And uh, uh, these two functions here mean and variance are subs can be subsequently utilized as a surrogate function for my cost. In particular, if I wanna be aggressive and exploit the posterior distribution of my J, I can simply set my estimated function to be the posterior mean of my GP. If I wanna promote some sort of exploitation exploration, I can consider the so-called upper confidence mound where I 
I want to minimize the mean, but I also want to try to explore. So I want to look at places where the variance is high to better understand what are the preferences of the user at those particular points. Perhaps an illustration is useful. And uh, uh, let us consider the case where the ground truth uh, is a quadratic function that is color coded in green. And let us consider the case where we have two, four, six, up to 18 uh, function evaluations uh, from, from the user. So you see that the estimate for two function evaluations is pretty bad. Here, the trajectory color coded in blue uh, represent the posterior mean, and the shaded region is the posterior variance. But you see that you know, even just with four function evaluations, I'm already able to understand where the minimum, the bottom of the function is. And again, this uh, estimate, uh, estimate becomes uh, more and more accurate with the increasing of the number of function evaluations up to this point where we identify fairly well uh, what is the potential uh, preference for, for the user. And this, this interval here doesn't really play any role since the algorithm will not uh, go in that area under some conditions that I will show. However, uh, we also consider a different method that is called shape constrained Gaussian process. What does it mean shape constrained? Well, if we have a prior, uh, a prior uh, that tells us that uh, the cost function of the user is, uh, for example, convex, or, or perhaps uh, as a, is monotonic, then we would like to enforce some curvature. And we would like to get an estimate that is, from a practical standpoint, strongly convex and smooth. How do we do that? In order to do that, we uh, enforce that the posterior distribution of the second or the derivative of our cost function uh, follows a truncated, a truncated Gaussian process. Truncated in the sense that the second order derivative is lower bounded by gamma u, which will be the strong monotonicity coefficient of the, of the estimated function, and is after bounded by given, by given a constant l u, which will be the smoothness coefficient of our, of our cost function. And I'm not going to go into the details in this case, but even in this case, you can find an expression for the posterior mean and the posterior function of this shape constrained Gaussian process. Uh, just to show you the very same example uh, and how this estimation procedure works with a shape constrained GP, uh, let us consider again this quadratic function. And now you see that for when we have two functional evaluations and we impose this particular truncated, uh, truncated distribution for the second order derivative in these uh, pink points, you see that we can have a posterior mean that already looks like, almost looks like a, a strongly convex function. And you see that with the increase of the number of functional evaluations, we can approximate better and better our original cost function, which is expected since our original cost function is already uh, strongly convex. So again, what buys you the shape constraint GP in this case uh, is to find the surrogate uh, cost function that has very appealing mathematical properties such as strong convexity and, and smoothness, which will have an impact also in the performance of the algorithm. Now, these were just two examples as to how to run uh, online learning procedures uh, to estimate the cost function on the fly. But let's go back to this closed loop uh, algorithm uh, where again, uh, we have an online algorithm with both the plant in the loop uh, since we utilize measurements from the plant, from the power grid in this case, but we also have users in the loop. Uh, they may give us feedback uh, in a parsimonious manner and it will allow us to reconstruct uh, the cost function. Now we are interested in analyzing the performance of this particular algorithm. To this end, uh, let me uh, just denote for simplicity as capital FT, uh, the, the model-based cost function, JT plus CT. And uh, uh, the particular map of my project gradient method can be written as the composition of the projection operator with this uh, identity minus alpha gradient. Let me denote with the vector E sub T the error that I compute in the computation of the gradient at time t. 
So this is the estimated gradient, and this will be the true one. Again, the error is, can, is due to measurements in the output of the power grid, or can also be due to errors in my estimation of the cost JT. Now, what we did was to model the norm of the vector ET with a subweighable random variable with given parameter theta nu t. Now, the, the, one of the possible definitions of the subweighable distribution is the one that you can see here. And let me just say that theta is a parameter that dictates the rate of decay of the pills, whereas eta t is a proxy for the variance. Now, why did we pick a subweighable distribution? We pick a subweighable distribution for many reasons. First off, the class of subweighable random variables is closed with respect to sum and products. And this will become, will become very convenient for us when we utilize concentration inequalities to establish a convergence of the algorithm in high probability. But further than that, the sub the sub a subweighable random variable subsumes sub-Gaussian random variables and of course Gaussian. And we obtain a sub-Gaussian distribution by simply setting theta to one half, sub-exponential by simply setting theta to one, and all possible random variables with finite support. Even a Bernoulli random variable is a subweighable uh, random variable. But also what the, the enticing, the enticing uh, characteristic is that uh, we can also capture heavy tails. So for instance, if I go back of one slide, you can, this is the particular, uh, uh, the probability of the random variable X being greater than a given value. And you can see that with the increasing of the parameter theta, I can consider thicker and thicker tails. So I can, so this will give me the flexibility also in a power grid setting to consider faulty measurements or measurements with outliers or very, uh, very uh, uh, approximate estimates of the cost function. But in order for my algorithm to be, behave well, uh, let, me, uh, let me actually introduce an additional assumption, uh, regularity assumption. And we on the on the estimated gradient uh, nabla hat. So we say that there exists uh, a given point in time t after which uh, this set of uh, inequalities here is satisfied for given real number a t b t c t and d t. So without delving into the all the all the details, uh, let me just move on the right. And just show you that, just tell you that collectively these conditions ensure that minus nabla hat, although uh, is an approximate gradient, is still a direction of sufficient descent. Uh, meaning that, uh, for example, the angle between minus nabla hat and minus nab and, and the minus the real gradient is sufficiently small. This is just a regularity assumption that allows me to. Uh, to avoid the case where the estimate of the gradient is consistently bad and may actually drive me towards consistently towards the opposite direction of, uh, uh, of the gradient. So I, I will be maximizing a cost function instead of minimizing. So with these particular uh, assumptions in place, uh, let me show you uh, the very the, the first result. And the first result is for the case where our map calligraphic uh, T is contractive or quasi-contractive with a given uh, coefficient rho T that of course is strictly less than one. Uh, so the theorem goes like this. So let us assume that our cost function is uh, strongly convex and the step size is chosen appropriately so that we have a contracting map. And suppose that uh, uh, UT is a sequence generated by our feedback based on an algorithm. Then the distance, the mean of the distance between my iterate and the optimal solution of my time value optimization problem can be bounded in this particular manner here, where we have a first term, we have a first term uh, where the coefficient theta t uh, vanishes, uh, is monotonically decreasing with respect to t. So asymptotically, this first term here vanishes, and this represents nothing but the transient of my um, of my algorithm, and then a term that will represent the asymptotic error. 
In, in fact, if I take the limit for t that goes to infinity, this will nothing but the asymptotic error tracking error, which depends on the error that I commit in the gradient plus the time variability or drift of my uh, optimal solution. Now, this is a resulting mean. Uh, we, are not, uh, we are not fully uh, fully satisfied with that. So we also want to present a result in, uh, in a high probability. And the high probability means that uh, uh, this particular bound here uh, holds uh, with probability one minus delta, with delta, of course, between zero and one. So you see that we have the very same mathematical structure of the results in, for the convergence in mean, uh, but in this particular case, uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, factor nu i for, the, uh, for our available distribution. Now, before proceeding, I would like to stress uh, a couple of things. Uh, so you may tell me that convergence in mean implies a convergence in probability uh, via Markov. This is true. The problem with Markov is that uh, we will scale as one over delta. So uh, as delta approaches zero, meaning high probability, uh, the, the bounds will be a little bit meaningless. Instead, in our bounds, uh, the factor here scales as logarithm one over delta. So we still obtain some meaningful bounds for uh, when delta is approaching one. As a corollary, uh, we, can also, uh, we can also establish uh, asymptotic convergent uh, in an almost sure fashion, where E bar and sigma are upper bounds of our error in the gradient and, uh, and the variability of the problem. And uh, when we have vanishing errors and vanishing time variability, this is a case that is not of interest in power grids, but still uh, from a mathematical standpoint allows you to recover traditional uh, results in terms of almost sure convergence of iterative inexact methods. As a last remark, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just tell you that similar results can also be shown for functions that are not convex, but for example, satisfy the proximal polyagrius condition. And we can also have extension for non-convex functions upon uh, appropriately tweaking our, our algorithms. So in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna skip this, the case for the fixed point residual, which is the, uh, appropriate when the cost function is convex, but not strongly convex. And uh, I'm just gonna provide one remark uh, as to what happens when we consider the full-blown automation problem that I showed initially. Well, in this particular case, uh, we can utilize an online primal dual algorithm as usual. And uh, uh, the only difference relative to traditional primal dual method is that we may consider a Tikhonov regularization of the Lagrangian with respect to the dual variable. So here, calligraphic L would be the traditional Lagrangian, and we add this term that is strongly concave in the dual variables. This leads you to have a unique approximate KKT point, which, however, does not coincide with KKT points to the original problem. However, you can find this reference of Kosher et al. Uh, that the distance between an original solution and approximate KKT can be bounded. Uh, so we can conform with, uh, we, we can work uh, in a very comfortable manner with this Gorilla Lagrangian. If we use a Gorilla Lagrangian, we can, util, we can basically draw similar result uh, with respect to the one that I showed you. If we utilize, if instead we don't utilize the regularization, this primal dual map is in general non-expansive and we need to resort to a, uh, to a different convergent result in terms of um, conversion of the fixed point residual. So I went a bit fast here uh, because uh, I look at the time and uh, I wanted to show you, uh, I wanted to cover actually the last part which may, might be of interest to some of you uh, who are looking at uh, uh, distributed methods. Uh, why? Uh, the main reason is the following. So far, I, I presumed that I have one user uh, that, you know, uh, one, th that this cost function here is associated with one user, but we can in fact have multiple users associated with a device. So for example, if I have just one user associated with one device, I just have one cost function. But if I have multiple users, something like multiple occupants of the same office, uh, I, my function j associated with the device is actually given by the sum 
of cost function associated with each user. So in a sense, I can modify the problem in this particular manner here, where for every device M, I have a sum of cost functions, each associated with each user interacting with, with that particular, the particular device. And of course, we also have the system operator. Now, this is a problem because the set point of the particular nth device is now affecting different users. So if we truly wanna utilize the algorithm that I showed you before to solve this problem here, we will need different users to share information about their comfort, their discomfort, or which uh, may not be, may not be uh, pertinent for, for privacy standpoints. As an example, you know, if you share an office and UM is the temperature set point, for instance, you may have, you know, again, different people having uh, different perceptions of, of discomfort associated with different temperatures. And in order to solve this problem here, these two should uh, exchange information about their preferences. Now, how to deal with this case? Uh, well, if you consider a device that is shared by multiple users, we can modify the problem. And the way we did it uh, is to introduce auxiliary variables, UM1, 2, and 3 in this case, since we only have three users, and uh, ensure that these three people here agree on a particular standpoint or the particular set point. And the way we do that is to uh, replace uh, in the argument of this uh, function here, the local preference of the user J for the device M. But on top of that, we also need to add these consensus constraints that ensure that the actual set point of the device is equal to the preferred set point of the user. So the, this particular formulation that I showed you and this one are equivalent. I'm just adding auxiliary variables as you know, it is customary in consensus-based optimization to promote uh, the composability of uh, optimization algorithms. And in fact, if you allow me to write this consensus constraint here, this particular compact form, where D is again a matrix that captures the connections between each user and the particular, de the particular device, I can again write down uh, a, primal a primal dual uh, method with feedback in this particular manner here, where the first two steps are the same as before, but then I'm adding this particular step where new are the dual variables associated with this consensus constraint. And uh, this matrix DU basically capture exchange of information between user and devices. For example, in order to compute this step DU, I'm gonna have a message passing between user and uh, uh, user and device regarding the preferred set points. And uh, uh, each set point UT is decomposable across devices. So I get a fully uh, distributed algorithm with message passing between uh, users and between, uh, and between, uh, uh, yeah, and between users and devices. Uh, now, let me delve very quickly into a representative example. Uh, let us go back to our demand response. And suppose, for example, that we have 30 DRs uh, in our neighborhood with a given, with a given some, some office buildings. Uh, we have HVAC systems, electric vehicles, and storage systems. And we have rooms shared by multiple users. And let us consider the case again where we want to try to drive the net total power consumption towards a particular reference point, YRFT, in an effort to provide uh, services to a grid. Uh, let us use real data from NREL with a granularity to one second, and let us assume that one, one step of the algorithm is run every one second. So what I'm going to show you in this particular plot is the following. First off, the yellow trajectory uh, represent the total non-controllable power. Uh, just to emphasize the time variability of this particular, of the, to of the total non-controllable power. Now, what we want to do is to follow this Y ref, which is color coded in gray, within a 5% bound. And Y is the actual net power, uh, net uh, total net power. And you see that this algorithm is, is able uh, to, to follow uh, the, the, ref, the uh, 
set point within this plus minus 5% error margin. Uh, and this particular, this particular plot here uh, that is zoomed for, for just you know, uh, a given amount of time, uh, capture the disagreement between the uh, users sharing the same devices. For example, users sharing the same room and therefore trying to agree on a preferred set point for a temperature. Now you see that the error is in the order of minus two, 10 to the minus two on average, whereas the absolute value of the, of the command is in between five and 10. So basically we have a disagreement of the order of 1%, which is clean, clearly uh, negligible. Uh, as a last remark, uh, let me show the very same plot, uh, but let me show you uh, different trajectories for the case where, uh, uh, sorry, this is not very readable, but why star hat is the optimal solution when I know the cost function, but and I use feedback from the network, and why uh, why t is the is the output of our algorithm when we use Gaussian processes to learn the cost function on the fly, and we get, for example, feedback every thirty minutes. So here is a zoom version of one step change at uh, after you know five hours, and you basically see that the difference between the yt star and the yt hat is basically negligible. So this tells you that the GP or shape constraint GP is an effective way to learn the cost function from the users on the fly. And here there are basically the uh, set point, the trajectory set point for three different devices. Again, uh, the dashed line is the case where uh, uh, is the output algorithm, the solid line is the case, uh, sorry, uh, when you, when you know the cost function precisely, uh, and the dashed line is when you run our algorithm. And again, you see that uh, the difference is basically uh, negligible. Um, all right. I, this brings me to the conclusion. So what I want to show you in this talk uh, is, to, uh, is the formulation of time varying automation models to, uh, to model the operational trajectories of the power grid more specifically the operational trajectories associated with different tasks, such as demand response or SOPF, and how to synthesize online algorithms with feedback from both the uh, physical system and the user to track optimal solutions. And this provides also in terms of theory an extension of uh, gradient methods with plant in the loop and user in the loop. Uh, as next steps, uh, we are going to further explore data-driven methods, uh, and we're going to try to derive customized proofs uh, for the particular method that we use. Uh, and in terms of application, my group uh, uh, is, of, of course, continuing to work on power grids, uh, but is also looking at application in transportation systems, uh, and recently also in, uh, in healthcare. All right, thank you again for the invite, uh, and uh, uh, I will be... Uh, very happy to respond to any questions that, that you may have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emiliano. That was really good. That was really impressive work. I, uh, I'm sure we have a handful of questions and we got some clap emojis coming through too. Uh, I guess I have one clarifying question uh, that, and I'll get it started off and then Please. folks can chime in uh, as they see fit. Uh, I think it was early on. I was wondering what the signal. So, so I understand we're learning the user preferences using the the Gaussian process. Yes. What is the signal to the user, and then what is the signal that they send back? Is it is it um, a comfort score or an amount that they use? Yeah, exactly. This this slide exactly. Um, right, right, right. So, if we tie it to to examples in power grids, so you in this case would be basically the set point, of the power set point for your device, mm -hmm. uh, and the the J. So, suppose that you wanna uh, minimize the discomfort. So, the Z in this case would be a rating uh, in terms of uh, level of comfort, right? That you have with that particular set point. So, for example, your parking. Uh, your electric vehicle, uh, the U is the is the current set point uh, for the for the rate of charge, uh, and with the based on the rate of charge, uh, you get a, 
an estimated time all you know full charge for full charging for your vehicle right yeah so then you can pay you can say yes i'm comfortable with that uh, with that time so 10 super comfortable no i'm very displeased that's zero yeah and and the decision the you decision is made uh by is it correct to say a centralized aggregator who, who's weighing the different cost functions of the various users very good question. So sorry if I was a little bit, uh, if I was a bit too, too uh, fast in this case. Uh, so you can envision, you can implement these algorithms in both a centralized fashion. Yeah. And in this case, uh, the step of the algorithm uh, will be performed centrally by a network operator, DSO, yeah. if you wish. Uh, but you can also you can also implement these algorithms in a decentralized fashion uh, by uh, leveraging the decomposability of this step here across devices. So in this particular case, uh, you have uh, that the DSO is going to broadcast the measurements of the Y to every single device. Mm -hmm. And then this step here is performed locally at each individual device. Okay. So, so going back to the example of the electric vehicle, this one is going to be performed at the, in the microcontroller inside the charging station. Uh, this one is going to be given by the, you know, by the uh, user, by an app, and Y is going to be given by the DSO. And, and when the user indicates uh, their level of discomfort, uh, what, what's to prevent them from saying, I'm very uncomfortable, please stop changing, uh, I guess I'd use the room temperature, uh, or I just want the, the fastest charge time. Is there, is there a notion of price that the user has to balance? that comfort with, or is it just? Yeah, that is, that is, that is a very nice question. So if I go actually to this for, to the general, let me start flipping slides quickly. If I go to the general formulation like this, all right. Mm -hmm. So if you assume that the GT uh, models, you know, hard constraints of voltages or power flows, right? Uh, we, I mean, every user cannot simply pick uh, the, the set point that is the most convenient for them, right? Because this will lead to violation of the constraints, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, the, so there is this embedded notion of, of price, uh, if you wish, uh, that will be associated with the dual variables, uh, uh, again, associated with this uh, set of uh, constraints. Uh, in fact, uh, you could... Uh, uh, I mean, this was a conversation that we had some time ago, but you could uh, think of the dual variables uh, associated with this set of inequality constraints uh, with, you know, uh, distribution LMPs. Okay. And, and the, um, w w what's the GT function here? Because uh, the big G, I think of as linearized power. Oh, oh that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, the big G, uh, the matrix G basically, uh, let me go back. Um, <clears throat> just don't, let me find the slide. Uh, the big G basically in this, in this case will be our map, right? For the physical system. Uh, you know, this is just, you know, the, uh, it depends if you use, you know, um, a linearized SOPF, uh, then in this case, you can use this one. You can obtain G using lin this flow. Uh, in a demand response case, uh, this is just, you know, matrix of all ones. Uh, but you can also consider uh, consider nonlinear maps uh, if you want to use the full blown AC parallel equation, uh, with the danger that you know this one leads you into a non convex formulation. But this is okay uh, so long as the map is still you know uh, Lipschitz uh, with respect to you. Uh, I just decided to present the, everything for convex uh, in a convex domain for simplicity, but yeah. this one doesn't prevent you to consider your nonlinear maps. Okay. Uh, and again, this constraint here, to go back to your point, uh, really depends on the application. You can capture uh, voltage constraints, uh, constraints on the uh, power flows, for example, a substation. So any constraint on electrical quantities that are of interest to the DSO. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, that helped clarify perhaps. Uh... I know Gabriel has a question and, and Johnny has a question as well. Johnny, would you like to go first and then Gabriel, you can go next. Uh, sure, I, I just typed my question into the chat. Um, thank you for the talk. So um, 
Yeah, maybe you could, if you see the chat, you could just read it there. John, uh, do you want to read it out loud? For the I'll read it out loud. Okay, so, so my intuition is that some of these DR applications, there could be the linear cost functions and constraints where there's not a unique optimal set point, but um, a set of, of multiple optimal trajectories. And okay. I was trying to, you know, I think in the, you, you set up the problem so there's a strongly convex cost function. I'm wondering if, if it's still convex, but just not strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, if this, you know, how this feedback loop would need to be, yeah. you know, generalized to accommodate this. And I was also thinking that the tracking problem right. is, is tracking a single vector, but if there was a set, um, if that could be handled by this approach. Yeah, this is a nice question. Thank you for thank you so much for asking that. So, uh, these 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 algorithm works uh, uh, no matter whether the function the function is strongly convex or not. Uh, the difference is that basically, uh, let me go here. You can use different uh, ways uh, to oh, no, one sec. Here you go to measure the drift uh, of the solution, right? So, <clears throat> if the function is strongly convex. Uh, you can, for example, define the sigma t, the drifts in this particular way, because you know that ut plus one star and ut star are unique, right? Uh, but if the function is convex, uh, and for example, you have a compact set of optimizers, uh, you can use the outdoors distance between two consecutive sets of optimizers. Uh, of course, these two are equivalent in the case of a strongly convex function, right? Uh, the case Great. where Thank they're you. not, oh, sorry. Oh, just thank you. That that was I, I, didn't, I missed this point on the slide, and that helps clarify. Yeah, yeah and, and I was just going to mention that um, I was just going to mention that. Uh, um, so, oh yeah, that this of course this one this definition here is not relevant uh, for the case where the the optimizer the set of optimizer is unbounded, right? Because then the distance will be unbounded. Uh, so this is the case where the the analysis fails. Uh, and just to give you, yeah, sorry if I went fast, but actually if, if I skipped that, but I was uh, a bit uh, preoccupied of, of the time, but uh, when the function is uh, uh, convex, but not strongly convex, uh, uh, we can basically, there is no notion of tracking, right? Well, the notion of tracking because the solution trajectory is not unique, as you mentioned. So what we did was to consider the cumulative uh, fixed point residual. Uh, and you know, if this quantity here, for example, the sum of the fixed point residual converges, uh, then you also have a weak convergence of the sequence UT to a, 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 an optimizer. Great, thank you. Yep. Gabriel, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Professor Dalanese, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Um, so I was just wondering about like the actual implementation and about like uh, the computation of this uh, of the yeah. algorithm to provide the set points and um, and like for example, um, like in terms of like implementation of like in system of like arbitrary number of buses where like the computation like would you know intuitively get get. Uh, would take more time. Right. Um, so if you could like, comment on that. Um. Let me go back to the example of the feeder, for example, right? So, so, um, so if you have a situation like this, you know, where you have a lot of buses, uh, uh, you can, th there is no much increase in the, in the computational burden of the algorithm precisely because of the decomposability of the step across devices. So this, this, so the step of the algorithm are not sequential, but can be done in a parallel fashion. What, re, what really matters, uh, unfortunately, in terms of uh, scalability is uh, the number of measurements, uh, YT, that you want to collect, right? So if, if uh, PG&E tells you, oh, in this particular feeder, uh, I'm just, uh, 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 I know that I can just monitor one, two, three, four, five voltages, uh, and I'm fine. Then basically, you can just collect five measurements, uh, six if you wish, also to, to monitor the substation. But if instead uh, the, the utility doesn't have 
any clue about the controllability of the feeder and tells you, oh, I need to monitor the voltages in every possible bus. <laughs> then in this case, you need to collect again thousands of voltage measurement at every step. And this clearly slows down the, the execution of the algorithm. Does it make sense? Yeah, so you're saying it's more in terms of uh, the data collection rather correct. than the actual like implementation. Of the correct. Okay. Correct. That... correct, correct. Thank you, that helps yeah. a lot. Great. Yeah, and, and thanks uh, Keith for setting this up. Oh, of course. Does, uh, I have one more question. Oh, yeah, please. Open it to anyone else if they want to butt in. Yeah, please. Um, well, you can ask after me. Um, my follow-up question was, I think on slide 10 or so, where you compared the, the gradient descent with the second order methods, I found that to be a fascinating result, essentially that frontline optimization gradient uh, descent. Things. Oh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, I will find it, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just keep talking, but uh, I, that plot. Yeah, there you go, okay, yeah. yeah exactly, okay. so gradient descent is outperforming uh, the nest trough acceleration and then the heavy ball is actually unstable and then it's unclear if the conjugate gradient is going to be stable or not right i was wondering if this is uh i guess an indicative example of what generally happens or if this is a special case where uh heavy ball i mean i guess what i'm wondering is if heavy ball it's common for it to go unstable in in on optimization and also if it's common for uh gradient descent to outperform nest drop acceleration or if this is an example of when it might do that? So this is an excellent question, Keith. Uh, and the answer is that uh, we don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. We don't know because again, the uh, inaccurate in uh, analysis uh, of heavy ball and Nestro with an online setting is still an open problem. Uh, we did find uh, sufficient conditions uh, under which uh, the heavy ball diverges. Okay. Uh, so at least you can find the cases where it diverges, but uh, you know this, this this is just one example of behavior uh, of online algorithms. Uh, but again, you change the cost function, you change the way the cost function evolves over time. You may get again a totally different set of uh, trajectories. Right. So this is still an open problem. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly a lot of interesting work to be done there. Perhaps on uh, constraining, say, the rate at which the cost function can change. Right. Uh, in under certain circumstances, perhaps Nestor off acceleration does outperform gradient descent, and in other circumstances, perhaps gradient descent outperforms, but. Uh, that, is, that is correct. Um, sorry if I didn't show it, uh, but uh, we do have, a, uh, at least we do have a theorem uh, that tells you a, a universal lower bound in terms of ability to track for stony convex functions. Okay. So for sure. For online optimization. I'm sorry? If for online optimization. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So that tells you that, you know, any first order method cannot beat the lower bound. Okay. Uh, but to further respond to your question, uh, this is precisely because right now we are using uh, uh, like, you know, gradient, gradient methods or proximal gradient methods because we understand uh, sufficiently well the behavior. Uh, uh, once we understand the behavior of Nestrov uh, acceleration in online setting, we can also revisit the synthesis of these control type algorithms using acceleration momentum. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, um, I might be interested in working on that too. So I think uh, folks are starting to log off. So I'll thank you for your time and, uh, and the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great talk. Yeah. I really appreciate again, you know, the, uh, the invite and it was nice to, to meet uh, uh, all of you at least virtually. Yeah.